Now we're going to welcome in our next guest. We have the lovely Dashipu, who has Hello. been hanging out with us for most of the day, actually, in mm -hmm. the chat. We've had some fun little comments from y'all. Uh, we're really excited to hear about your work tonight. Well, it's nightish for us. 5.30? 5.30 is night. feeling like night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go for it. Hi, everyone. I'm Radan uh, Wypirowski. And uh, yeah, I'm going to tell you about uh, a series of projects. You know, one project, you start one project, then you get an idea from it for the next project. And, uh, you know, it never ends. So a couple of years ago, uh, I, I'm a Python developer. So a couple of years ago, we wanted to run some workshops for people to teach them uh, Python programming, basically. And, uh, you know, you want people to be interested, to, to program something that they actually want to, to write, not some random thing. So we, we figured out, okay, we will make computer games because everybody likes computer games. Everybody is interested in computer games. Unfortunately, when we actually tried to do this, uh, we spent half of the workshop actually you know, getting Python installed on all the laptops that people brought and getting all the dependencies installed and debugging problems with them and so on. So we figured out, okay, there has to be a better way. And on top of that, once people wrote their game, uh, they couldn't just, you know, send it to a friend, uh, email it to a friend or whatever and tell them, OK, this is a game I, I, I wrote, try it. Because the friend would have to install Python and all the dependencies and everything. And at the time, that wasn't as trivial as, as it is now. So uh, we figured out, OK, we need some kind of uh, solution for this, something where, where Python is already installed. And about that time, there was a Kickstarter for the MicroPython which, if you don't know, is, is a version of Python that runs on a microcontroller. So we thought, OK, we, we, we can make a device that already has Python running on it. And you just you know use that so you don't have to install anything. It runs on the actual device that you use for the workshop. But uh, there was a further complication in that uh, you still have to get your code somehow onto the device. And uh, that's a bit trickier. Uh, fortunately, uh, a fork of MicroPython came out called CircuitPython, which uh, makes that even easier because uh, you basically connect the device. It comes as a USB drive. And you can see all the Python files on the device. And you just edit those files. If you, I can share my screen. Does that work? Right. So I have a, a little device that we made. This is basically uh, an uh, 8 by 8 display made of uh, LEDs and uh, you know, your, your usual D-pad and buttons. When I connect it to my computer, uh, you can see that it comes up as a USB drive. And you can see this is, for instance, the main file that displays that menu where you can select the game to run. But you can replace that with uh, your own game while you are running, uh, working on that game. So that every time you, you save this file, the device restarts and runs your game, your new code. So it's uh, super, super easy, super fast uh, to experiment with your code, right? So we, we perfected those devices. We, we made uh, a couple of more versions of them. And uh, we ran different workshops with them. But at some point, uh, we uh, realized that, you know, uh, 
a game is uh, is a cool thing, and uh, you know, having a physical thing in your hands is even cooler. It's really a different kind of programming when you when you program something that you can hold in your hands. That really gives you a completely different feel. But uh, you know what's even better than having uh, something in your hands? It's programming something in your hands that actually moves. And uh, we we realize uh, that if you have a small robot like this, and you can program it, that's even more you know motivating for people uh, to learn programming than than uh, than the computer games. Uh, so I, I, this is a, one of the robot, one of the first robots uh, that I built. You can see I'm using the cheap blue servos. And uh, since I didn't have access to a laser cutter or a 3D printer at the time, uh, the legs are basically made of those uh, plastic horns that you get with the servos, and they are just glued to it. So the idea was that uh, you you don't have to have access to you know special things. You can just buy the servers, you can connect them to the microcontroller, upload the code, and, and it works. And the problem I had with this particular robot, or later version of it, uh, which is more streamlined because it's a PCB with an Arduino on it. So the problems problem I had with those is that those cheap servers are quite cheap but they are not that cheap. You, you still need 12 of them. So even if they cost $2 a, a piece, it adds, to, to, adds up to $24. And if you, you know, add more things, it gets quite expensive. So uh, I, I worked on this a little bit more. And I came up with this design, which I call the fluff bag. As you can see, by that time, I, I, the laser cutting became accessible. So you, you, can, you can now order things or online, so you don't even need to have a fab lab or, or a laser cutter in your area. You can, you can just order things. And uh, basically, the body is made out of PCB. There is a ESP32 S3. I guess uh, S2 was the first one, now, now I'm using S3, uh, controlling it. And uh, the robot is quite nice. One, one trick I, I uh, we use is that you always have problems, you know, like this with too many cables. The, the cables are always too long and uh, you don't know what to do with them. So we used IDC connectors so that you can, uh, you know, snap those connectors in the middle of the wire at the distance that you need and cut off the rest of the wire. This turned out to be a bit problematic later on because, uh, you know, once you cut something, you cannot uh, undo that. And uh, when people do it uh, in a workshop, it, it's uh, a problem. But uh, yeah, basically it has a battery uh, underneath those uh, this PCB. There is uh, battery protection and uh, you know, power circuits for the servers and for the board. And the board is running uh, circuit Python again. So again, you just connect it to the computer, and uh, there is a nice working uh, algorithm for it. Uh, will it work? It will not. All right, so this one uh, is programmed so you, you it uh, comes up as an access point. You have to connect to it with your phone, and then you see a website where you can control it. It's a bit uh, involved, so I won't be doing this right now. I can show you the, uh, the older one with the 12 servos uh, that, that was controlled with. Uh, you you have to trust me that it actually works, and uh, in, it has several different gates and and so on. So it's quite nice. Uh, as you can see with this design, I I got uh, rid of 
four servers, which basically is uh, thirty percent of the of the servers. Uh, by doing this, I I still manage to make the robot work properly. Like you you still have inverse kinematics in here. Uh, uh, no, it's all open source. All, all the uh, designs I'm showing here, they are published on hackaday.io. And the, uh, some of them are even certified with OS open source hardware. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, so, so we we did some workshops with this one. As I said, there were some problems with the with the servers and uh, it's also uh, a little bit uh, big uh, to my taste because you cannot really make it walk around your desk easily. So I, I found, uh, you know, servers that are even smaller than those. And uh, here's the guy. Uh, I found uh, servers that are half the size and decided, okay, maybe I can make a robot that is half the size. I had to switch to a different microcontroller board. This is a uh, Seed Studio Xiao. You could also use uh, QtPy from, from Adafruit or a number of compatible uh, boards like that. And uh, you can see it has the, the same configuration, except I no longer used uh, uh, laser cut legs. Uh, instead, I used uh, PCBs because it became small enough for the PCB to be, you know, affordable enough. So you just break it up. Those are the mechanical parts that you need for the uh, for the robot. And uh, yeah, this is the PCB you need for the body. Uh, again, it, it only has a battery on it and uh, a power circuit for, for battery protection. Oh, and I also added an accelerometer on it so that you can you have at least uh, one sensor on it. And again, you can switch it on. Uh, and this one uh, has a little sensor in here, so I can... Uh, control it with a, a TV remote, basically. That's the easiest way to have a remote control something. So the, the problem with the eight only eight servers in here is that uh, it cannot turn in place. It basically turns like a tank by, by moving legs on one side faster than on the other side. But uh, otherwise, you get to you know experience all the fun of programming a legged robot, where you do inverse kinematics, where you do the virtual vehicle thing, and and so on. So it's actually uh, quite uh, advanced for for this kind of uh, stuff. I also uh, because you know it was Halloween last year, so I decided to try and make a uh, more like uh, encased version of it. So this is an uh, iPod case and there is a robot inside of it. And if I switch it on, because I use smaller battery, it can, it's kind of shaky. So it gives it this additional neurotic uh, feel. Uh, right. So once I made one that is half the size, I, did, I, I thought maybe I can make one that is double the size. <coughs> so we have one. Let's remove the hat. So that was uh, my first attempt at this. I, I just found some servers in my drawer. I found a, a random, uh, you know, boost converter and so on. This is a, a Pipico clone. And uh, you can get it. You can see it's not working that great. I had to. I initially used uh, wooden legs, uh, but I had to replace them with aluminium legs at some point, and I cut them myself by hand. That's why they are so uh, uneven. 
because they wouldn't like uh, legs just snapped. Because you know, you make a robot uh, two times bigger and it becomes eight times heavier. You make a robot four times bigger, it becomes, I don't know, four, two, that's it. Uh, so at some point I just say, okay, I, I will redo the big robot, but I do it, I will do it properly. I will buy faster servos, I will buy a proper case, and uh, I got those legs laser, uh, those uh, aluminum legs uh, CNC'd and, and uh, anodized so that uh, it's a proper aluminum thing. Uh, I also added, because the size started to, you know, scare me, so I added this uh, emergency uh, button on it. Uh, and this one is also controlled by, uh, by the remote control. By TV remote, I'm thinking about adding uh, a proper controller, like the radio controller stuff. But, uh, uh, as you can see, the, the gate is not very smooth. I need to work on the code to make the movement more smooth. And uh, yeah, that's basically all the robots I have. Those are amazing. <laughs> Some wonderful robots. I really, uh, uh, Laura's comment here, Laura, very right. Lots of great hats. Amazing I love hats. a robot with a hat. I do yeah, the hats that. really add character. <laughs> <laughs> it really makes it more fun. <laughs> so we'll get you, you mentioned that everything is is documented on your Hackaday IO profile. So we'll make sure that uh, right. those links get to everyone so that people can make a uh, cool and iterate on cool creatures of their own. Um, thank you so much. That was really awesome to see like every iteration and hear all about your process. So thank you so much for joining us and giving us such a great insight into your robots. And we will speak to you soon.